Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle Finance Decision Maker Expo. My name is Nick with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our esteemed speaker. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsor's virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our speaker, Rahul Trivedi, former Vice President of Operations, TransUnion. We're super excited to have Rahul with us for a keynote presentation titled Finance Automation Trends for Success. Welcome, Rahul. Over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. And uh, thank you uh, all for attending this session. So before I jump into this, uh, automation in the finance industry uh, has a long history. Uh, finance uh, industry was the among the first uh, uh, industries uh, which adopted automation. Uh, I remember uh, back in uh, 2015 uh, when uh, RPA and automation was still not a buzzword and uh, uh, only one enterprise grade uh, automation solution was available at that time. Uh, uh, that's a blue prism at that time. Uh, roughly like 50% uh, uh, of all the uh, automation work was coming from the finance industry. And, and there is this uh, uh, like uh, good reasons uh, for finance industries fast adoption or early adoption of automation. Uh, however, the use cases have been proven and then other uh, industries have also adopted automation and wherever the processes are involved, uh, uh, automation has been adopted. Now, uh, virtually every medium and large size organization has uh, some kind of automation program, automation COE. Uh, even smaller organizations uh, are adopting automation. If they are not having their own automation COEs, uh, they are leveraging some of the SaaS solutions or using some kind of a third party based solutions. So what can we do in order to uh, make the existing programs more successful? And what are the current trends? That's what this uh, uh, presentation is about. So uh, I am a big fan of uh, three. Um, so like three things easy to remember, and that's how I have formulated my slides. So every slide will have uh, three uh, themes or takeaways. So how the uh, uh, evolution of the finance uh, automation has happened? So it started all with the cost reduction. Uh, in the finance uh, uh, automation, uh, there are certain business processes which need to be followed. Uh, most of the time, uh, these uh, business processes have a very uh, well-defined uh, way of executing a process. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, these processes are required by the uh, regulatory needs uh, or they could be through the internal uh, uh, policies and the processes. But nevertheless, these processes need to be executed and that's how we, that's where the initial focus was that can we reduce the cost of these business processes because essentially it's a cost of uh, operations and the cost of compliance and that's where the automation uh, journey started then the second uh, advantage which came uh, in the finance automation was the reducing the risk uh, humans make mistakes and those mistakes cause the variance. And there's those uh, mistakes, they cause the variance on the processes, that how the process is executed. And uh, as a result of that, your business outcomes and the results uh, will not be consistent and constant. 
by automating those business processes, we reduce the variance, we reduce mistakes, and we reduce the risks. And then uh, the last part, uh, which was there uh, in this automation journey that the enhanced functionality. So uh, speed of uh, automation could be somewhere 5x to 100x faster. So, uh, or, or, or uh, let's assume the worst case scenario. So it can be like 1x to 100x faster. So if you have a really slow backend systems where automations um, need to really wait for a slow system responses, um, it could be uh, uh, same speed as a human executing. Um, but if you have really a fast backend system, such as like uh, those traditional uh, like mainframes, uh, uh, mainframes uh, while uh, archaic and old, they, they are generally very fast in terms of responding and humans take a lot of time to navigate while uh, automation systems can just send the keystrokes to them and uh, get lightning fast responses. So that... Uh, faster processing and then enhance the functionality so those were the some of the key advantages which have driven the automation so far but what's coming so that is the hyper automation so hyper automation is when we start automating things from beginning to end uh, traditional uh, automation and rpa that was related for a particular task, but not for the whole business process from end to end. And that's what the hyper automation is, that when a process, uh, data comes, a request comes in the enterprise, it is processed at every stage through the automation. Of course, you got to have the proper checks and balances. Uh, if certain approvals need to be done by certain level of executives, you got to have those kind of uh, uh, checks and balances built into the system. But otherwise, uh, your process should be able to run uh, from end to end. And that's where the future is, that when the enterprises become uh, fully automated, uh, uh, then you can do a lot of things. Uh, on. I, I was uh, uh, speaking to a vendor yesterday uh, and uh, they were showing me like how their system helps in uh, ushering data from a point A to point B and how it can uh, understand the user request and based on the organization policies, it can answer the questions uh, uh, without anyone ever seeing that user query. Um, there are still things which need to be done in those kind of systems. One is that the trust and the reliability. Uh, we do not want to have uh, another chatbot responding to uh, air travelers that the ticket is fully refundable and then being held liable in a court of law. Uh, uh, so we need to have a proper architecture to evolve uh, and respond in a correct way uh, every time, all the time. But that's where uh, we are heading to. So uh, uh, here are some success stories of hyper automation. So these stories are uh, from some of my past engagements uh, uh, when I was in consulting and uh, when I was leading the business transformation effort at uh, TransUnion. So this accounts payable. Uh, so at uh, one of the uh, my previous clients, uh, they used to get like thousands of types of different types of invoices and then by automating so the, uh, and uh, this organization already had some automation so it's not that everything was manual and then uh, uh, this automation solution was being deployed for the first time no they already had some solution but with the help of advanced ocr with the help of advanced uh, uh, ai and machine learning they were able to further reduce the 60 and the labor cost so that's a great savings when you already have some kind of automation in place. And then um, uh, this expense management transformation. So every organization has uh, uh, this issue of uh, uh, managing the expenses and enforcing the policies. 
to reduce the risk to the company uh, and to the uh, to reduce the uh, risk for the compliance a uh, lot of advanced algorithms are now available uh, which help in uh, drawing some kind of trends and patterns which raise red flags uh, so it's a kind of a similar kind of a intelligence like what we call in banking the structuring problem so instead of making one ten thousand dollar deposit if you try to uh, uh, go under the radar and try to deposit two five thousand dollars that uh, is detected and that has been a well-defined problem and uh, it has been uh, uh, de uh, detected for a long time so similar kind of a things are there in the expense management uh, uh, that you want to detect certain trends and the patterns uh, and then uh, reporting so uh, there are, i have seen lots of success stories in the financial reporting um, uh, reporting is one of the uh, essential uh, tasks in every organization however generally it is uh, one of the most uh, uh, repetitive and uh, probably uh, one of the most hated H hated is a probably a strong word but least liked uh, task um, by people who have to do it on a, on a specific uh, period of time um, so lots of uh, this financial reporting now uh, is is being done through hyper automation uh, I was with one of uh, big technology vendors uh, uh, last month and they were telling me that uh, now senior executives can uh, just uh, query their uh, backend database by uh, English language query because now they have a Gen AI uh, uh, engine in front of uh, their uh, database. So uh, lots of... Uh, advanced work is now happening in this area uh, to make um, these automations uh, quite impactful. This also gives a nice segue into my next slide, and that is the data part. So uh, uh, data uh, so far in the automation journey uh, has played a role uh, in defining that what we are going to automate. It hasn't played a central role typically uh, in terms of dynamically changing the behavior of a process. Now with the data being available and being seamlessly integrated from centralized repository and available in real time with the business processes, this is going to take our business processes to an entirely new level. And what I mean is that the businesses will be able to react uh, to what is happening in a much faster uh, time frame. Um, data is available, um, and then immediately business processes can be updated uh, to react to it. And then, so what are the key things uh, for the successful data integration? So one is like the data quality. Uh, almost every organization has data and almost every organization has data quality issues. Uh, there are very few organizations uh, which can claim that their data is accurate, neat, clean, complete, uh, and ready to use. Often the data is uh, distributed, uh, not easily accessible, data is incomplete, incorrect, uh, data governance procedures are not in place. And this could happen due to a variety of reasons. It could happen because uh, of the legacy systems. It could happen because of the acquisitions uh, where the uh, data repositories are spread all over the place. It could happen uh, uh, due to different teams. Um, it could happen because of the uh, regulatory requirements such as uh, data residency laws in uh, different countries which uh, prohibit uh, the data to be stored at one place. So there are ma many reasons for this data to be fragmented uh, uh, for uh, not having the poor quality of data but ultimately that is what 
an organization need to do that in, they need to have a good quality of data on a uni unified platform with good data governance. So uh, how this uh, data is going to help uh, an organization? Because this data will uh, help in maximizing the value. So you might have heard of this saying that data is new oil. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what uh, the, uh, I mean by maximizing data value that when you have data now with the help of the data you can drive the insights and those insights will help in improving the efficiency improving the profit margins of your organization by few percentage and that few percent you have that will give you an edge over your competitors and with the help of the ai driven analytics where you can uh, have AI run on that data, you could get uh, actionable intelligence. So we had an age, uh, an era where uh, we had these data visualization platforms and those data visualization platforms uh, can uh, present you a good picture of the data. However, those uh, platforms were generally not intelligent enough uh, to tell executives that uh, something which was not in that visualization chart or platform, um, uh, there is something else they need to look into. Now, with the help of AI-driven analytics, we are reaching at a stage where the backend algorithms will tell uh, leaders and the decision makers that something else very important, which they have not been looking, is happening and they need to uh, look at that. But for that to happen, we need to have the clean data, we need to have a centralized data, we need to have good data governance so that the data is trustable. So uh, what are the benefits uh, of this data-driven aut automation? So one of the big benefits is that uh, efficiency gains. Now, data is driving the algorithmic behavior and the process uh, direction. So people don't have to go and look at and statically analyze uh, that if this happens, then do this. If this happens, then do that. Now, algorithms themselves are smart enough that with the help of the data, they are able to predict, they are able to act, and they are able to suggest things which leads to much higher efficiency. Second is about the risk reduction. So if you don't have a real-time data, then you are acting uh, on the automation which was designed with a particular sets of assumptions in mind, uh, often based on the data which was current at that time. So from past to present, there is a certain variation and that introduces the risk. With the help of data-driven automation, that risk is reduced because you are acting on the latest data. It's uh, like uh, uh, in the yester years, uh, we used to have uh, uh, maps without real-time traffic. So uh, you print the map uh, or you look at your uh, um, basically atlas to go from a place A to place B. And now we have dynamic traffic-based maps. So it is able to direct you through the uh, shortest route, uh, sometimes uh, through the uh, subdivisions and um, back roads or back streets, uh, but it gives you the optimal path in the given situation. That's what data does. And that's what it reduces your risk. And then uh, third thing is strategic transformation. So an organization which can improve their margins, which can reduce their risk, uh, uh, that organization has an edge over its competitors um, uh, in the world. Uh, so what are some of the challenges uh, of uh, this uh, uh, in this kind of automation? So one is that the data security. Uh, this is a very hot topic related to like data management and ensuring data because data has been coming from from so many sources and uh, there are 
so many uh, places, uh, so many teams are involved. Uh, so this uh, data security uh, needs to be addressed. Then second part is like championing the change management. In business transformation, the most important aspect is change management. If organization is not supportive, if people are not on board, that's where the changes fail. So the typically uh, the statistics which is quoted is like more than two thirds of all uh, business transformation fail. And number one reason is because of the executive sponsorship and the uh, organization buy-in. So champion the change management. And third is the ensuring the scalability. Once you start a small, scale it big, uh, apply it across the organization. Um, uh, just a few quick points uh, because we are getting close to the time. Uh, is that so? What are the uh, things which we need to do for embracing the future? Yeah, so one is that continuous innovation. We are still at a very stage, early stage uh, in this automation and AI journey. Uh, where we were like five years back, if you look back, versus where we are going to be five years from now, we will be much uh, better in terms of the capabilities five years in the future as compared to five years in the past. And if you look at like 20 years in the future, it's so difficult to predict because the, not only we are uh, getting faster and faster, our rate of this innovation is also increasing. And rate of innovation is going to further accelerate once we have the machines doing innovation. I'm a big uh, 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 optimist in terms of uh, looking for the future for uh, technology solutions and its capability to help uh, humans. So I, I feel like uh, this continuous innovation path is a necessary path for the organizations to stay ahead of the curve, to stay competitive. Second is like a strategic focus that uh, organizations need to start thinking about uh, this from the cost reduction uh, play to what uh, these automations will give them the strategic advantage. So an example I would give is that uh, at uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, past engagements, uh, this uh, automations were able to generate additional revenue for this organization. And it was simply because when the organization tried to do this process manually, the cost of doing processes manually was way higher than the profit they were getting, so they could not do those business processes. Now, with the help of automation, where the cost was 150th as compared to do human doing, now they could do. There are lots of those kind of opportunities there for organizations where they will be able to change their strategic focus and improve their revenue and profit margins. And then uh, uh, last is like that, we are going to be in this world of uh, where Lots of our decision making, similar to like navigating in a traffic, will be data driven. Uh, whether it is health, whether it is uh, your work life, whether it is your trades, anything basically will be data driven. And with that, uh, uh, that's those are my slides. Uh, I, I am ready to take the questions. Great, thank you, Rahul. Uh, here's one from the audience. What are the challenges and best practices for successfully integrating machine learning, AI, and RPA into existing financial processes to drive automation? So in terms of the challenges, one of the big challenge is uh, related to uh, uh, change management. Uh, so uh, there is a still a big population of people uh, which is highly skeptical uh, towards uh, automation and AI, and, and rightfully so also. Uh, we have seen uh, job market uh, taking a little bit of dive uh, since uh, Gen AI was introduced, uh, especially at the entry levels. We have seen uh, uh, a big cut because 
organizations either they hired a lot or they think uh, that lots of entry level jobs are going to be replaced with the help of ai uh, there was a recently an article that google uh, is uh, generating more than 25% of the code uh, through gen ai right now so that means those entry level programmers jobs are being cut um, uh, there are some senior level jobs are also being cut uh, so people are skeptical so this change management and then getting the buy in that's a big factor in terms of the organizations uh, uh, adopting and integrating machine learning and ai uh, during my uh, automation and business transformation consulting career i worked with lots of clients and when i see the environment where uh, people are afraid uh, people do not want to cooperate uh, it becomes really really tough uh, for or the initiative like this to be successful so that is one big factor and then the other factors related to especially related to machine learning and ai is related to data governance uh, there are scenarios where data gets leaked or the model parameters getting leaked so you might have heard of the case when uh, uh, and, and this was from the early adoption of Gen AI that uh, Samsung's proprietary code got uh, somebody accidentally put it on GitHub uh, in a public uh, basic repository and uh, they lost around $10 million or something like that. So having a proper governance structure uh, so that uh, your organization's confidential data is not leaked uh, or even the trained model parameters are not getting leaked uh, uh, so that is the other challenge. And the third challenge is related to justifying the business cases. Uh, so uh, very few organizations are getting right now a, a positive ROI uh, on uh, uh, AI uh, uh, or Gen AI use cases. Uh, 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 I was in another uh, uh, conference uh, with the senior executives and and I had a figure that right now around $700 billion is being spent on infrastructure uh, every year for Gen AI and only $100 billion worth of revenue is being generated. So uh, it's a hard to prove uh, or hard to justify a business case for investment. However, organizations need to look at it that as a future capability building as an investment in terms of building the muscle for future. Uh, so those are some of the key challenges. Uh, um, now, in terms of the best practices um, uh, for change and transformation, uh, it's all about communication. It's all about ensuring people that uh, how this uh, uh, change is going to impact them, provide them retraining opportunities, uh, generate new business opportunities to make sure that uh, people feel safe and secure. Uh, in terms of the data governance, uh, the best practices are that you got to have a proper uh, risk assessment committee and then act on it. If your organization does not have the capabilities, there are outside organizations which specialize just in terms of the governance. Take help from them, but pr probably don't uh, sit on it for two years uh, because then you are wasting time and losing competitive edge. And the last, in terms of the finance and the business case, um, think of it as capability. The organizations which adopted um, internet in 1990s, uh, they still had edge 20 years later. So early adopters, generally they learn lessons and then they have a continuous edge. Great. Well, thank you again, Rahul, for such an incredible keynote. And I want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. This officially concludes the Argyle Finance Decision Maker Expo. Thank you again for joining us today and engaging in our content. We look forward to seeing you at the next Argyle Digital Finance event soon, which will be our Financial Controller Forum on November 19th, 2024. Have a great rest of your day.